This is the third complete perfect day. Completely flawless. In which you mindfully observe the results of your endeavors practicing meditation. What kind of results have you been getting? Being aware, reflecting on, you say, reflecting on, and you find uh, your mind becoming confused, you find a lot of depression or anger or uh, discouragement, doubt. You find your mind becoming obsessed with memories or thoughts or whatever. Just to observe, you're not trying to figure out why anymore. Why you have thoughts, why you think the thoughts you think, or have the memories you have, or feel the way you do. But just observing what you're doing, like you know, developing the Anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath. Uh, gave, that's a kind of a, a beginning just something to do. Like I said, like uh, friction, like on a sharpening stone when you sharpen your razor. You have to, in order to get the razor sharp, you have to uh, cause friction. So, anapanasati can be, uh, is like friction, it's uh, something that you're not uh, skilled at doing, you're not trained to do it, you have to kind of make yourself do it. Bring the mind, your attention back to the breath when the mind wanders, even though you don't want to bring it back to the breath. You begin to observe, you know, the... <coughs> The kind of energy that you that you that you have in the moment, <clears throat> the wandering, fantasizing mind, or the depressed uh, feeling, the doubts and uh, uncertainty about whether you're doing it rightly, or whether you're capable of doing it at all, or hoping that you get some kind of good result from it. Mm compelling yourself, forcing yourself to do it when you don't want to, then giving up in discouragement and so forth. You begin to see, just observe what, what the way you approach anything is simply just watching your breath. Theoretically, it's understandable, isn't it? It's under, explain it as a, as a method and something that one can do. It doesn't take any great uh, intelligence to be able to understand uh, how to do it, but it's the actual doing it. And then the results we get, we observe. The attitude, as I was saying previously, is very important, is because if we approach something with the wrong attitude toward it, towards ourselves, we end up by destroying the razor we're sharpening rather than sharpening it. Like if you if you want to sharpen a razor, you you figure out how to how to do it in the right way, which way to to move the razor on the stone and so forth. And rather than just taking a stone and a razor and, and uh, causing friction, like you can bang them together, and that's friction. <laughs> you can bash the razor with the stone, or the, ra or, or the stone with the razor. And there's different ways of, of causing friction, but it's not to get friction for its own end, but to Learn to develop a skill so that you, uh, say, are sharpening something rather than dulling it. So the right attitude is one of 
careful of observation of attentiveness to what how you, the results you're getting but always in that place of calm and peacefulness rather than of frantic desperation desperately trying to get it shortened it's like taking a razor and grinding it on the stone <laughs> you'll just end up with a completely useless razor so to, to sharpen the razor probably have to have a kind of a calmness the right touch on the stone so that you get a nice smooth stroke and that's a gentle kind of thing it's not something harsh and hard and aggressive and forceful it's that amount of effort it takes to lift the hand up play, hold the razor hold up the stone and, and move it along the stone causing the proper amount of friction or sharpening it and that you only know through through practice you can't, no matter how much you might read about it or understand it theoretically, it's only in actually doing it that you develop the skill. So the attitude is one of calm, cool, collected peacefulness with what you're doing. So that's why in this meditation retreat, regard each, you know, like each day as just a, a, as, as a good enough in itself, rather than you know, I've got to get make progress today so I can get the pass the examination at the end of the course. That kind of worldly student's attitude that I've got to really struggle and force and cram everything I can in so I can pass the exam at the end of the course. The examination is always going on. It's being mindful all the time. So there isn't any examination really. I used to have a reoccurring dream in which you know, during the first few years of practice I kept having this dream that all it would kept be in, uh, you know, in variations on the theme. But the theme was that I was doing something like going into a coffee shop or doing something, and then I say, "Oh, I shouldn't be doing this. I should be studying for the examination because the examination is, is due very soon, and I'm not ready to take it. I know I'll fail." And then I'd sit down and I'd, I'd, and this thing would be nagging away. I, I, I should be doing something else and other than what I'm doing now because of the exam. So wherever I went, whatever I did, there'd be this nagging feeling that there's something I should be doing. Then what I'm doing now is, isn't what I should be doing. There's something else that I haven't done yet that I need to know and do in order to pass the exam. And so this, this dream kept reoccurring in my, when I would fall asleep. And I, what is it trying to say? I've been practicing meditation for years. And I said, what have I, what have I, uh, what, what do I have to do? Have I left something out? Is there something I haven't studied yet? Or haven't, <laughs> what should I be doing? Uh, well, maybe I should maybe I should read the suttas. Maybe I should study Pali. Maybe I should delve into the Abhidhamma. Maybe I should do this or that. Maybe I should develop all the jhanas. And maybe I'm not ready for the exam yet. And the doubts would come into my mind that somehow that there was something very difficult yet that I had to study and do in order to pass the exam. But as I kept reflecting on this dream, it would keep reoccurring, I thought, it's trying to tell me something, obviously. Uh, what, is, what is this dream about? What have I not done that I should be doing? And I kept reflecting on it, and finally one day I had an insight, and I realized quite clearly 
that the answer to the dream was that there wasn't any examination. <laughs> I've never had the dream since. <laughs> just this doubt and this fear and all this thinking that there is one. I thought there was an examination I'd have to pass. But then one can say the examination is going on all the time, isn't it? In other words, being mindful is the way to pass the examination. Now in um, meditation, when you're starting, when you're a beginner, you've got to realize that it's like time, like sitting here on this retreat, for some of you who have never done a retreat before, it's like tying yourself down, putting yourself in a straight jacket, or even like sometimes probably like nailing yourself on a cross. I mean, you're bound and restricted. You can't talk when you feel like it. You're, you're, you're sitting a lot, sitting for the formal practice of walking and so forth. You're, you're tied up, you're bound, you're restricted. You can't do what you, you feel like doing in the moment. You can't just follow your whims and impulses. You have to sit and endure through the impulsiveness of the mind. And because of that, because we don't, we can't, we don't have the uh, ability or the opportunity really to, uh, to get rid of, to, to just follow the impulse or to repress it, we have to more or less uh, endure its presence that kind of energy that would make us go off and do something else than what we're, that we're sitting here. And then the impulses, restless impulses arise. We want to do something, go somewhere. Pain from sitting too long arise. We want to get rid of the pain. We want to re- or, or, or reflect, reflexively just move to get away from the discomfort. The mind is confused or depressed. But when we bind ourselves down to something, when we tie ourselves up, we tend to feel very angry sometimes. A lot of aversion arises. If we feel negativity arising that we probably never noticed all that much before. Like if I were to hold you down, take you physically and, and hold you down to the floor, pin you down to the floor, you'd feel a lot of negativity toward me, wouldn't you? Well, the same applies when you're when you're bound here to the to the sitting posture to the meditation retreat. You can you can direct that negativity to me or to yourself or whatever. You can you know, how what your patterns of your habits of, of being negative will will become apparent to you. Because you can't do what you want to do, you can't just follow your habit with, uh, the way you can. If, if, there's, if you're not on a 10-day retreat, or you're not under someone else's direction, when you can live life on your own terms, do what you want, and uh, eat when you want, sleep when you want, do or uh, follow your very impulses when you feel like it, and then suddenly there's no, 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 you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't talk, can't you eat once a day, so forth, so that you find you're bound and restricted. So if some of you are experiencing a lot of negativity, that's a natural result of being bound and restricted. It surprised me when I 
the first few months of meditation when I was a Samanera, how how uh, much hatred and anger I was experiencing. I never thought of myself really as being a negative, hating person. You know, one has a kind of an image of oneself as being a certain kind, a certain type of person. And my self-image was being a, a jovial, good-hearted, a kindly person and then during those first few months of of uh, meditation I found out all kinds of ugly things in me that began to bubble up just I couldn't think of a nice thought about anybody for weeks at a time even when like one old lady in, in Nong Kai, Chinese lady, decided to 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 bring food to me. I I even hated her half most of the time. <laughs> and I hate, I felt so much hatred for my parents and for I felt this incredible amount of aversion coming out in every direction. And it was something that I was rather shocked at seeing because when you think of yourself as a kindly, gentle and, and good-hearted man and then you, this really nasty bitchiness kind of spews forth all the time, you, you don't quite know how to deal with it. You think this meditation is really... Before I meditated, I was kind and gentle. <laughs> And now I've become a nasty, bitchy person. But this was a natural result of one thing, being a a Samanera, not being able to, to get away from negativity, like like in lay life, I realized that so much of the negative impulses, I just, uh, as soon as I felt their presence, I'd get away from them as soon as possible. There are all kinds of, of uh, habits I developed in which I could escape from the negative side of life as quickly as possible. Smoking cigarettes and drinking and watching television, reading books and chatting with friends and going uh, to the cinema and so forth. There are all kinds of ways you could get out of if you were depressed or miserable or full of anger. You could get away from it quickly by uh, getting, uh, changing the, the, the mood into something else you found exciting or interesting. But as a Samanera, suddenly I was denied all possibilities of escape. I just sit there in a, in a little hut. Not a very nice little hut either. I, found, I spent a lot of time criticizing that hut. <laughs> <laughs> and sitting there, with a mind full of this anger and aversion. But I realized, I kept, uh, kept, uh, I still had the, uh, enough uh, wisdom to stay with it. I just kept, I realized that there's really nothing much one could do because, you know, if you tried to stop it all and, and make it stop, it seemed to, it took so much uh, effort to stop the flow that you could only hold it down for about two seconds and then it <laughs> blow you away again. And since you were uh, bound in a, in, a, in, a, in a yellow robe, in a, in a, in a uh, ramshackle kuti, and you didn't dare go out or do anything because the people, the other monks would know, you had no escape. You just decided to just resign myself to my fate and uh, stay with it. And, uh, and in that resignation, 
was a kind of peacefulness I developed towards all this negativity. In other words, I just began to accept my fate and, and just uh, stay and, and allow these things to just come up and go. And that's the, 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 the attitude which is beneficial toward liberation. Just uh, not rather than trying to get rid of these bad moods or repress them or change them, but just allow them to just observe that they're changing conditions. Be at peace with them. Don't be frightened by them. Don't be appalled by them. Just uh, see them as changing conditions. It's kind of a, a cleansing of the mind. Where before you, there's so much of yourself you kept holding up, pushing down, repressing, and you found uh, you, you spent a lot of energy in your daily life just trying to keep the things, keep from having to look at a lot of these un- ugly, nasty things. And now you have all the time in the world just to observe these things as they come forth. But you're not, you're not saying, oh, what an awful person I am to have such ugly thoughts or feelings. But you're just observing the anicca of these conditions. <laughs> Keep seeing these as anicca rather than as personality problems or defilements that are yours that, you, that, are, that make you some kind of evil demon or nasty person. Begin to think, no matter how rotten and ugly and disgusting it might be, has just changed because those, all those conditions that that are ugly, nasty, and rotten are never permanent conditions. There's nothing permanent uh, that you can find that is nasty and ugly. The very ugly nastiness is an impermanent condition. I guarantee it. Even though when you're caught in an ugly, nasty <coughs> hell for a while, it seems permanent. But that's because it that's because it has the appearance of permanency because you don't want it. Anything you have that you don't want has that feeling of being permanent. If you notice, if you notice, if you like when you're depressed. If you're in a depressed state, somehow you think, I'm always going to be depressed. I'm always going to be miserable. I'll never be happy again. I'll never have a joyous moment in the rest of my life. I'll always be this miserable, depressed being eternally, forevermore. That's what Christians call eternal hell. It, hell has this appearance of being eternal. But when you see that eternal hell is only a temporary, impermanent anicca, then you have insight into the nature of hell. Eternal hell is impermanent and not self. It is not yours. So even though things may seem permanent, that is how they seem, that's the seeming, that's the illusion they create in your mind. By reflecting on their changing, anicca, impermanent characteristic of suffering, depression, doubt, worry, fear, anger, greed, lust, stupidity, when you reflect on the changing characteristics, then you you begin to say, abandon your identification with the condition and begin to see it from a perspective of seeing it as, as, as a changing condition that's separate from you. It's not me, it's not mine. This is what we mean by anatta, not self. Where before, when you're attached to that condition, like if you're depressed, attachment to the depression thing, you think, I am depressed, I'm miserable, I'm no good, there's no hope for me, 
I'll always be miserable and unhappy and so forth. You think and you add to the depression, depressing thoughts that make you more depressed. And then you think, I'll always be depressed. And that very thought, I'll always be depressed, is has that illusion of eternity. I'll always be depressed, eternal hell. That's the illusion of the thought, isn't it? At that particular moment in time, you're thinking, I'll always be depressed, I'll always be miserable forever. That's the illusion of eternity, of being in hell for eternity. But see that as an illusion. Just like when you're, when you're in pain, physical pain, where you've been sitting for an hour and you have pain in your knees or legs, whatever. Now, that pain seems like, you know, if, if you had to, uh, if, if, you, if you watch a clock, you, know, you think you're waiting for a bell to ring, five minutes, say, five minutes for the bell, and you know the bell will ring and you'll be able to get out of the pain respect, uh, without losing uh, your self-respect. <laughs> so you think, five minutes left, oh that's not very long. Oh, I can endure for five minutes. And then you're waiting for the bell to ring and the pain increases and absolute agony and you think it should be five minutes by now and you look only one minute. <laughs> it has the because pain, when you're in pain, you have uh, what is what uh, say time seems to increase its length. One minute of agonizing pain is, 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 seems like an hour. An hour of happiness and bliss seems like a minute. Because that's the illusion of those conditions. Heaven, heavenly happiness was what we like and what we would like to have for eternity, isn't it? I'd like to be happy forever, in love forever, romance forever. I'd like to have uh, all this beauty forever. Heaven. We'd like to, to stay in heaven eternally. But the illusion of heaven is that it seems to go by too fast. It's too impermanent for us. Heavenly happiness is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, it goes by too quickly for us when we would like it to stay on and linger hour after hour after hour day after day, month after month, year after year they were talking about the illusions that we have in dealing with time the, the feelings, sensations in the body, the moods that we have the illusion of self as connected to these particular conditions, these changing transient conditions. Just like one minute of pain is like one hour. We don't want the pain, we'd like to, the pain to go away. We'd like it to go away instantly, as quickly as possible, not have to wait, because physical pain has it makes us terribly impatient. We, we want to get away from it quickly. The quicker the better. So, even a minute of pain seems like an eternity because we don't want that pain. And when we don't want, when we have something we don't want, we want to get rid of it immediately. As quickly as possible, destroy it, annihilate it. without, because we're impatient. That's the blind reaction to the unpleasant and painful. Then the reaction, blind reaction to the pleasant and the beautiful is, uh, is uh, wanting to possess it forevermore, make it mine forever. I want this beautiful thing to be mine forever. 
I want this pleasurable feeling to be mine forever. I want to be happy like this forevermore. I wish I could always be happy and joyful and loving like this all the time. The, the, the illusion. Wanting something that you like to be yours forever. Wanting to get rid of something you don't like that you have already. Wanting to get rid of it instantly. As quickly as possible. Now observe this in your mind. You know, you're just observing. You're not trying to, trying to change anything. But just observe the way things are. So you'll not be deluded by these conditions. Because it's the delusiveness, the, the illusions of these experiences that is the suffering. It's, it's thinking that the, this pain is, is mine forever, or this ugly thought is me, or these terrible memories are mine, or these bad habits are mine, or this body, you know, if it's sick and weak or ugly or whatever, is me and mine. You don't know, want it to be me or mine. You want, want it to be... If it's beautiful, say we have beautiful body, beautiful appearance, beautiful thoughts, beautiful feelings, then we'd like that to be that way forever. To be forever eternally beautiful, radiant, and joyous, and happy. But since we find ourselves in this particular condition of the human form, <coughs> now let's reflect on this human body as it is in nature. It's an animal's body, isn't it? It's, it functions just like any other animal's body. Doris, uh, you notice she has two eyes, two ears, nose and a mouth just like we do. She has a heart and she has veins and liver and lean kidneys, big fat stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and she's been eating too much. Just like we would have if we were eating too much. <laughs> she has... Uh, we don't have fur all over our body, but we do have hair, bodily hair. She has claws and we have nails. There are slight differences. We don't have tails. <laughs> but notice this body, this human body, it, it, uh, its functions. Are we like to think of ourselves? Now, what, when you think of yourself, what you want to appear like to other people, what you want to the kind of impression you want to, to radiate outward to others uh, is that you're not an animal. Say if you're an animal that just eats and sleeps and goes, goes to the toilet like cat and like dog will just defecate anywhere, no, just right out on the road where we wouldn't do that. We don't want, we would, we would think, I don't want people to realize this is an animal's body. To urinate and defecate right now and, and chitters. So we have spent thousands of pounds building little cloths. <laughs> <laughs> we 
nice porcelain uh, toilet thing. <laughs> Clean water that we can wash our hands and making it fairly attractive and clean and pleasant, so that the course function of <coughs> elimination, the eliminating the bodily waste, is not too unpleasant for minds that's too much of of this uh, of the coarseness of this body. I was thinking uh, in the materialist uh, age of how much money is spent on beautif- beautifying and decorating the, the bathroom and toilets. Well, you can, in the, in the West, in Britain, America, America has some of the most beautiful toilets in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> Because in this position of, uh, that we have to put ourselves in, that's <laughs> okay. It's not one that we like to. <laughs> we'd like to have our photographs taken, <laughs> or something that we would want to say I have to share with any of our friends. <laughs> Because this is a coarse and gross function of the body, and something that we, we are ashamed of, or we would rather not uh, <laughs> have to think about as being ours. If you notice little children, uh, they they feel very different about it. Like before they're made self-conscious about it, they, they're quite uh, proud of, <laughs> of their defecation an elimination of waste because they get praised for it I remember my little nephew and he's been <laughs> trained for the party and uh, my sister would praise him every time that he went to the party so he would whenever guests would come to the house <laughs> <laughs> my sister would feel quite embarrassed about that But then we outgrow that, and we, we try to <laughs> <laughs> realize that that's not something that we share or boast about to others. Now this, just to, to see, to, to remind yourself that this is a part of nature, this is the course. And even no matter how refined we might become, no matter if we're... Uh, Queen Elizabeth, or the, or the most glamorous film star, or the most respected and well-educated man or woman, uh, no matter how important we are in the world, no matter how wise we become, no matter how refined we may be, we still have to perform these gross functions with the body. So we might be able to delude ourselves in a public image basis of, of say, you know, of appearing very well dressed, well, beautifully uh, presenting ourselves and as uh, to give the illusion of being not an animal at all, but being some kind of ethereal, lovely, celestial being. Is what we would like, would rather be mistaken for, like a star in the sky, a, a movie star, a glamorous, lovely, beautiful deva or angel, something that was, or an impressive um, a fighter, a warrior, a, a great uh, uh, father, uh, an all loving mother, uh, and identifying with the great mythical heroes of. Uh, Uh, of the past, we would like to seek our identities with those kind of qualities rather than with the animal ones, just the animal function. 
So even something like eating food is made into something so that the health, other, so that the kind of coarseness of eating is, is diminished. You can see in, in, in Europe the refined etiquette that they develop uh, in, in the eating of food, serving it in beautiful dining rooms on china silverware, crystal goblets, uh, sh- beautiful crystal chandeliers above, and everybody dressed in, in uh, fine clothes. Nobody, uh, everybody pretending to be like a deva. The men in neat suits and tie the women in satin gowns. And the, the illusion of glamour, of, of we're doing something that is very civilized and refined and lovely. Eating food. Just like Doris gobbles down a fish. <laughs> without any pretense at being glamorous. <laughs> so we have the illusion of being very refined and lovely in trying to make the gross bodily functions seem not quite so gross of course. So in our meditation we're, we're, we're not trying to uh, say, ignore these anymore, but to see them in a, in perspective, to s- understand the gro- the gross, the coarse, the necessity. It's necessary to eat food, isn't it? It's one of the, even though the the Buddha uh, forbade many things to because he didn't deny them uh, the food we were allowed to eat. Food. Now that's a necessity, that's something very important, just for maintaining this physical body so that it doesn't become too miserable a condition. So in the way we eat as bhikkhus out of the bowl, it's it's to be aware of this. We're not just eating uh, for the pleasure of the taste of the food, just for, to kill time, uh, or are we pretending to be glamorous devas, uh, we just eating, dumping it in a bowl and eating it, transfer, you look in, the, in your arms and you see you're going to transfer that food in, into your mouth, and it'll come, it'll go into your stomach, and then out, eventually. So you begin, begin to say, pay attention to eating itself, as just as it is, not with the attitude of aversion to it, but trying to see, make, bringing forth uh, that kind of awareness of the attitudes and feelings of attraction and aversion that you experience in regards to the eating of food. Now sometimes when you meditate, you get a lot of samadhi, you get concentrated, you get refined, so refined that you don't even want to eat anymore. Because eating is so gross, so coarse, that you can, if you can stay in samadhi for a long period of time in a refined kind of mental state, you'd rather do that than have to endure the coarse eating process. But eventually, even though you can stay in samadhi for a long time, you eventually have to come out of that and start eating again eating something, because the body needs that kind of nourishment. So the Buddha allowed us to to eat. And we eat one meal a day of food that's offered by generous lady. So you can see in the human birth, in your own mind, a longing for refine, refinement, desire to experience heavenly bliss and happiness, because in heaven there's no 
there's a heaven does not contain anything like defecation and urination. Pots of boiling excreta are strictly reserved for hell. <laughs> <laughs> Big tubs of uh, boiling excrement is reserved for the hellish state, not for the heavenly one. The heavenly ones are where you would be things light, clean, clear, bright, uh, beautiful, pleasant, uh, blissful and helpful. This is what we would like to have forever. If I punch her in the stomach, the same kind of unpleasant feeling that she experiences that you would if I kick, uh, punched you in the stomach. She wants to live. She doesn't want to die. She has a desire to, to live. And all animals want, would rather live than die most of the time. Sometimes the animals want to die. So this animal's body is a teacher for us. It's not something we should regard with contempt or aversion or mistreat or misuse, but to have the proper respect, a proper attitude towards it, is what we mean by metta, having the proper attitude towards this, this, this creature here, this being, this, this, this body, learning that how to take care of it properly without being neglectful of its needs or indulgent. Now the men mentality can become very refined. You can experience refined mental states of happiness and equanimity that go off into nothingness and the state of the highest state attainable for human for refinement of the Human consciousness is a state of neither perception nor non-perception. A mental state so refined that it's neither perception nor non-perception. Which is very, what a lot of people think is the ultimate goal of Nibbana. But the Buddha realized that even though I mean, he went through, he attained that state of neither perception nor perception, he realized that it's also an impermanent condition. And that one has to come down from that state and start feeding the body eventually. You know, you don't want to. He became emaciated. He had to eventually accept some milk from Sujata. rather than just stay off in refined uh, states of consciousness. 
you have he had to learn to say live within the restrictions and the conditions of the human form so even though we would rather not have to deal with the cause pain and gross functions of the body and we'd like to get as far away from that as possible part of our life has to inevitably is the we have to deal with these things with sleeping and eating with elimination of weight bathing so covering the body keeping it warm when it's cold cooling it when it's too hot taking care of it when it gets sick when it gets feverish when it becomes weak So the human birth means we can't stay too or too long in the day realm because this body will see that we don't. You can go up for a while to states of refinement, and then, but you inevitably come down, down to the coarse functions of the body with its pain. <coughs> now this, now how, now why is it like this? What is, what is the the lesson we have to learn from this? from these restrictions we find ourselves in, in the human birth. And this is why we're, we're here practicing meditation, developing this right attitude, this proper attitude towards the body and the conditions of the mind. And the, the proper attitude is being at peace with both the coarse and the refined. Taking no side, not trying to get rid of one and keep the other. Not trying to make one the, the refined states into my personal possession, my heaven, and deny and repress and get rid of that which you don't like. But it's that clarity of mind and seen in perspective of non-attachment that these conditions change. Heavenly happiness is impermanent and not self, as well as uh, <laughs> pain, physical pain, the body, the condition of the mind, no matter how gross or refined they might be, are impermanent, and anatta, not self. And so we during this lifetime, within this human form, under this convention of being a human being, the attitude is one of peaceful kindliness towards everything, towards the body, our own body, towards the conditions of the mind, towards those things that we perceive outside of us, the other people, the other animals, the other beings, this kind of peaceful coexistence knowing that these, all these conditions are just changing conditions, not changing. all that arises passes away, all that begins then So for this evening, we uh, start our fourth day, another perfect day, starting with this evening, 24 hour period <coughs> of learning to be at peace with everything, with, with whatever, with whatever is now. now just observe, how, how can you be at peace with things? With, when you're so used to, say, resisting, like if I were holding you down on the floor and you were resisting me, you'd, we'd both become exhausted. After a while, you can only do that for so long. And when you stop resisting and relax, you say, then you can be at peace with me which will affect me, won't it? If I'm trying to hold you down and force you down and 
keep you down on the floor, pin you there. The more you resist, the more I resist. So there's a struggle going on all the time, trying to resist each other, pushing and struggling with each other. But if you relax, just relax, then I have nothing to struggle with, so I can relax. In the same, in this, apply this to your practice here. Relax within it. Regard this meditation, this ten-day uh, retreat, as a time for mental ease, in which you can just be be aware of the dis-ease that, you, that comes and goes, or the pleasure or the pain that you experience. See it not as a test of your endurance to prove that you can do this or to compete with this person or to get something out of it or to get rid of your defilement or to get hold of the eye of the Dhamma unless it's the struggle and resistance where it's regarded as more or less a chance to you have uh, given every opportunity just to be at peace not much is demanded of you at all, is it? This isn't, we're not a, we're not a, a military camp where role is taken, where you have to report every half hour. <laughs> How you use the time is up to you. But this is a way, my way of suggesting an attitude which will be most beneficial for the practice of insight and wisdom. I've seen people go into meditation and spend years trying to get rid of evil and try to change this and try to become that. And and you wonder, they've been doing it for years, they never learn. They keep doing the same old things over and over. They don't seem to get any wisdom in even years of meditation. It's because the right they haven't developed the right attitude for them. They still do meditation with the idea of gain or with the idea of annihilation. The in the middle way is uh, is neither gaining nor annihilating. Transcending means not attaching to anything. It doesn't mean annihilating everything. It just means that gentle calm, nibbana, meaning being at peace with all conditions. It could be the body still functions, the mind, all that still go, but they're not, you're not reacting like a blind fool anymore to the to their changing conditions. You're not demanding that this animal body be a deva. You're not demanding that that uh, pain be other than it is. You're not demanding that the coarse bodily functions uh, be other than they are. You can be at peace even with with the the most unpleasant conditions. and with the most pleasant in you. Andhamayam vadagata tatu karam ghatam nase Sadhu, 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 sadhu vadam Five minutes break.